been successful at keeping a promise in, it makes sense that you wouldn't have confidence yet. You wouldn't trust yourself yet because you don't have the experience of doing what you say you're going to do. Okay. And that's why personal integrity is actually like building a muscle. It's a training. Welcome to the 1000 Day Sober Podcast. My name is Lee Davey. I am not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I am someone that doesn't drink alcohol and I spend every waking moment of my life helping other people do the same. Uh, I have two tattoos. I have one on my my calf. It's uh, a dagger and a rose with the word Ching written on it because Ching was my nickname when I was younger. And I, I got that tattoo. It wasn't planned. I was 18 years of age working at a place called Barry as a roster clerk. And there was a train driver there called Darren Edwards. We called him Oscar. And uh, I asked him what he was doing after work. And he said he was going for a tattoo. I said, do you mind if I come with you? And he said, yeah. And while I was there, I ended up having this thing done. Stupid, really. And I remember choosing the design because it looked like something that my dad had had on his uh, arm, which is a bit strange because I don't feel any you know, love or kind of like a affinity or affection towards my dad in any great way where I'd want to go and get a tattoo, but there you are. But then many, many, many years later, I had another one on my chest and um, it's just two Chinese, um, uh, what's the word, letters. <laughs> I couldn't even forget a word then. And it it's supposed to spell my name Lee, although I did once walk into a Chinese restaurant in Manchester and asked the waiter and he said it meant big one. So let's hope he was wrong and that it does say Lee. But this morning, my daughter Zia, who's uh, going to be four in September, she said, Dad, why have you got that tattoo on your chest? And I said to her, well, it's my name in Chinese. And I got it because I want to be proud of where I'm from. And then I stopped because these days more than most, I am thinking deeper than ever. I'm on week eight of an eight-week elimination diet designed to take the inflammation out of my body. Uh, it's um, after reading The Inflammation Spectrum by Dr. Will Cole, he's going to be a guest on the show in the coming weeks, and he's been on, the, he's been on here before. And I'm feeling tipped up, like I'm really sharp, really focused, feeling more intelligent IQ-wise and EQ-wise. And really, I'm like thinking about stuff. So, you know, I was like, hang on, do you, is that true? Is that just a story that you just, you just rolled out there, Lee? Are you really proud of being half Chinese? And, and it's a weird one. Like, and it made me realize for the first time in 45 years, and probably I've thought about this, but it was just crystal, crystal clear to me earlier on that. I've always been ashamed of who I am. So this all stemmed from being very young and being half Chinese and not being white like everybody else and being picked on for being half Chinese and being different. I think if if nobody picked on me, if nobody called me a chink and a gook and a Jap and uh, uh, all those different names, if people didn't do that, I think I would be okay with being half Chinese. It was the abuse that made me ashamed of who I am. But then as I got older, this, this fighter in me came out and I became really aggressive. So if anybody would call me names, I would just hit them. Uh, that's my, what my dad told me to do. It, I would uh, resort to violence. And suddenly being half caste Chinese and being English, living in Wales, that was another one, more xenophobia than racism, although two are both the same thing, maybe, I guess. Um, I, started, I started really being proud of being English, whereas before I was just English. Does that make sense? So, like, I'm just English. I moved to Wales. Everybody's calling me an English fucker, an English cunt, an English this, an English that. And all of a sudden, it's important to me to be English and to defend my Englishness because people are having a go at it and trying to single me out and make me feel different. Same with being half Chinese, except there was no pride in being half Chinese. I had no kind of like connection to it because I never met my dad, but I did have a connection to being English with the English football team. And I sometimes 
think about my experience watching England football as akin to going to war. Like I imagine serving in the military, would there would be this um, this real sense of pride of uh, like being being English and doing something for your country. And the only time I've ever felt that is through sport. And uh, so back to original, my original story to Zia, like I was never, I've never been proud of being Chinese because I just don't have anything that links pride to it. But I had this, I had this fierce um, protection of my right to be Chinese because of these kids picking on me when I was younger. And I, I think the tattoo is an extension of that. I think a tat, a, the tattoo is, is almost like I'm half Chinese. Got a fucking problem with that? More than I'm half Chinese and I'm really proud of it. Um, and it wasn't until this one that realized that, that that behavior, that aggression, that violence, it was a protective mechanism against a vulnerability um, that I really needed to express, which is, I'm really ashamed of who I am and I don't know why I am. And now I know that I was ashamed of being um, non-white. I was ashamed of being half Chinese. And I think that shame of being half Chinese is with me today, but manifesting in a different form. So I'm not ashamed of who I am or being Chinese or half Chinese today on a conscious level, but shame does surface about who I am as a person, my morals, my ethics, my values, the way that I behave, just who I am, whether or not I have the ability to um, perform at a top level, to do the things that I want to do, my efficacy, my probably linked to perfectionism uh, and workaholicism. And that all comes, I think, from being this little kid who just wants to have fun with his mates, but when he runs to them, they say, fuck off, gook. And, you know, in today's time when what is going on in the world with Black Lives Matter and stuff, uh, I just felt that I wanted to wanted to share that with you because that was uh, quite a realization that I had this morning. And I'm thinking more and more about these issues, uh, particularly because I now have a Korean daughter. You know, my son, you know, he, my son just looks white. He doesn't, he's a quarter Chinese, but he doesn't look, um, he doesn't look Asian at all. And, you know, my wife is Korean, my daughter's Korean. And, you know, I have to really start thinking about where, where, what's the right place for us to live in the world and to grow up and what's going to be, the best place for us and it's not a terrible thing when you think about it that we have to we have to worry about whether someone's going to walk up to my daughter and call her a gook uh just because she looks a little bit different it's quite sad but just want to shout out with you um i've done a lot of work all post stopping drinking like if i hadn't stopped drinking i would not be thinking this way i would not be getting to the bottom of these things i would not be understanding these things at all so um Please, 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 it's for anything. Stop drinking alcohol so you can start thinking about who you are, why you do the things you do, and hopefully coming out of that, like with me, you'll get some compassion and you'll just be able to look yourself in the mirror and go, I am perfectly imperfect. I am so proud of being different. I am so perfectly fucked up and lonely and disconnected and happy and sad and the whole gamut of emotions and that is cool because that is what it's like to be human anyway there you are um just want to say welcome to 1000 days sober to jam mike he's uh he took advantage of a three month and he's now signed up as a fully fledged member so go jam mike's really good to have him on board if you listen to this podcast with Alicia Rocco and really enjoy it and you want to learn more about the topic of personal integrity, then get over to www.1000daysober.com, find our podcast page, find Alicia's page. So she'll have a specific podcast page for this episode and you will be able to download the show notes and you will also be able to download a special workbook 
that is going to teach you more about personal integrity. It will also have all the links to Alicia Rocco's uh, website and the work that she does with the Handle Group. Well, and anything else that we've talked about in this episode that, that needs links, you'll find it at that podcast page. Also, we're doing some really good stuff at Instagram. I want to get the conversation going there. I want more engagement. So I'm thinking about how best to do that. But get over to Instagram, 1000 Days Sober. Join us on Instagram. And also join us on YouTube, 1000 Days Sober YouTube. We are doing two videos a week uh, with the help of strivers on all manner of topics to do with alcoholism. So sign up to our YouTube channel. Uh, what else have I got to tell you? you know, the 1000 Days Sober experience is still rocking and rolling. It's the only experience on the planet where we teach you to be go 1000 Days Sober. <clears throat> it's not a 30 day program or a course. It's not a it's not a uh, 90 day course. It's a 1000 Day Sober course, folks. 2.7 years, 40 pounds a month. It's an absolute steal. So get over to the website and join 1000 Day Sober experience. You get uh, full access to the Strive support system and you'll get all of our blog posts and uh, all access to our online support group meetings, access to work with our wonderful 1000 Day coaching team, uh, to be guided by our wonderful Strive ambassadors, 50% um, discount on all future uh, workshops. I've nearly finished the Loneliness and Connection workshop, first of 18 live online workshops that I'll be running and if you are if you are a 1000 day sober member you will get 50% off that price all right so plenty to do lots to get into and if money is a problem for you then that's all right just email me at thetruthaboutalcohol@gmail.com and i'll see if i can find somebody who will be willing to pay your subscription all right now on to our next guest alicia rocco alicia is on a mission to create positive change in the world she came to Handel Group seven years ago with a desire to change her career. And after spending nearly a decade in the biotech industry, participating in the launch of two successful life-changing medicines for cystic fibrosis and hepatitis C. She still felt, though, like there was something missing in her life. After one session with a coach at Handel Group, she quickly discovered what was missing. She wasn't living true to her own dreams. She wasn't happy and she didn't know how to become happy. This realization inspired a journey. Alicia became a coach, changed careers, learned how to date honestly, transformed the dynamic in her family, navigated addiction, and confronted how to create and maintain great relationships in her life. She brings a deep understanding of the handle method to the work she does with her clients and students at MIT. Her analytical mindset and process-oriented nature led to her work in the media division, and most recently to build, test, and launch Inner You, Handle Group's first digital course. Alicia grew up in Boston, and received her bachelor's degree in communication, film, and technical writing from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and her master's degree in organizational psychology from Massachusetts School of Psychology. She's certified in process improvement techniques, Six Sigma, Waha! she's a black belt, and she is a dancer and practices five, rhythm, five rhythms dance, something that I've tried before in the past and like. Uh, and Alyssa lives in New York, and we got her on to talk about that all important topic personal integrity because boy oh boy oh boy do we need it if we're going to be someone that doesn't drink alcohol so without further ado i'll shut the hell up and leave you in the capable hands of alicia rocco thanks for listening i'm talking to alicia rocco how's it going alicia hello thank you so much for having me on the podcast today no problem and yeah you, know, you know at the moment we're in i mean lockdown in los angeles just explain to people where you are in the world and how covid is affecting you both positively and negatively i guess yes well i'm a little bit in a unique situation i was living in manhattan when covid hit in march and i was actually about to go into surgery in manhattan oh. for a mass they had found and what happened to me was uh, not COVID related. They couldn't do the surgery. So I ended up leaving New York, went to Boston, about to go into surgery in Boston. That got canceled because of COVID. And it was actually a blessing mm. because the surgery I needed to have done um, couldn't be done in Boston. But I had been consulting with a woman in California and she said, look, if you can get to California, I can help you. I can take care of you. So on April, I think it was 8th, I left in the middle of COVID, took a plane, got to California, got myself in a hotel room, 
went into surgery with this woman and she really healed me. And so after that surgery, I thought it was going to be out here for like a period of three months. And turns out the whole mass was removed. And now I'm living in California because obviously (laughs) New York (laughs) is what it is, but it was a blessing that all of it happened the way that it did because I'm on Venice beach. I have a beautiful apartment. I'm working. Thankfully, my company was primarily online before COVID hit. So Mm. uh, it was easy for us to pivot. Now, obviously, I work with many, many clients in all different industries. So I'm really dealing with how to help people reinvent their relationship to their reality in this new circumstance. And that has been what I've been spending my days doing, but I've been doing it remotely from California, having healed my body because of everything that kind of went down for me. So that's my story. And how are you finding it being alone? Because I I imagine alone. I I mean, I'm I'm taking a big assumption. You might have moved with a barrage of people, but are you on your own at the moment? I am on my own. So how are you finding it being um, away from friends and family? You know, it is a, when I came out here, it was scary. I noticed that my, my thinking about it was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm doing this by myself. I have to go into surgery. Who's going to be here? Who's going to help me? And then I really relied on my structures, my prayer, my meditation, my writing to get me into the right way of thinking about it. And for me, going spiritual and really going, okay, how am I, how am I supposed to see this situation has always served me. And it's interesting because What happened was when I went into that surgery, like the second surgery, the anesthesiologist walked in and it was actually someone who I'd gone to college with, right? And then now I'm like, and then there's like actually lots of people in California that that have left New York and they're like, hey, do you want to go for a a socially distanced walk? Like, Mm -hmm. so things happen, connections happen. And I find that Um, I'm able to Zoom with my family. So me staying connected to people and using technology has been huge. And then also relying on connections that I didn't even realize um, has been useful as well. Actually, on that that you just spoke about yesterday, so we we at 1000 Days Sober, we have what we call the 1000 Days Sober Experience. So it's a it's a 2.7 year program because that's how long it takes to get 1,000 days um, of online coaching and support and uh, in-person coaching, that kind of thing. And we were talking yesterday in a lesson on armor, three of the lads who were taking the experience, uh, they were talking about their fears, um, quitting alcohol and their fears of either being ostracized by their tribe and feeling incredibly lonely or their status weakening within that tribe if they stop drinking. So, you know, by status, I mean that maybe they think they're the alpha male and they go out and they're all laughing and joking and they think if they don't drink, they're going to retreat down the pecking order and they're not going to like that. Um, So then I said to them, but it's really interesting that if you speak to people on Strive who are more towards a 1,000 days journey, they'll all tell you that they went through the same fears and they did, in fact, lose their friends, some of, some of them, all of them, some of them, a few of them. But as it turns out, they don't care or it doesn't matter. And if you had that crystal ball and you could see that, it would give you the confidence to just focus on yourself and not worry about things that you don't really have to worry about, but it's natural to worry about. And so I guess my question I ask them, Melissa, I'll ask, I'll ask you the same thing. Yeah. Why? Why? Why are people so afraid of um, their status dropping or losing their friends? And B, when it does happen, why doesn't it matter? Why doesn't it bother you as much as you think it should? Yes. Well, I think that every human I've ever met, and myself included, has fear that is from 
you know, that we didn't even invent. Like it's really from generations and legacies behind us, fight or flight. Like there's, there's lots of science around fear and how it wires our brain. And I think anytime fear is meant to keep us safe and protected. And so change of any kind, even on the small level, there is that thought, like, what if, what if this doesn't go well? What if I get hurt? What if people leave me, right? Because being alone in the world or being abandoned or being rejected, like all of that goes back to this, you know, death, like ultimately like the, the, so does this make sense? Like it's really backed by millions of years of evolution and that's what is triggered in our mind Mm -hmm. when we're faced with change. Okay. This is why change is so hard. It's not because we don't know the right changes to make. There's millions of diet books out there. Okay. And then why are we obese? Like there, there really is what fear paralyzes us in. And once you take the actions to have a different reality and you experience something different, you realize that the truth, which is revealed in the experience is better. Mm. Like there are many times, at least there's learning, at least there. So there's something new that gives you a different experience. So for me, when I was drinking, I was petrified of not drinking because my whole family, like I grew up in an Italian, Irish family, loud, partied, drinking. I didn't want to be ostracized. I didn't want to be separate. I didn't want to be different. And then when I started to take, do that opposite action, which is a lot about what we're going to talk about, I think today in personal Mm -hmm. integrity, taking those different actions, I was then given what I needed in my experience to realize, oh, I can do this on my own. Oh, I can meet new people that care about the same thing I do. I can't. So the new experience then had me let go of the past and let go of the fear. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, just to summarize, you're saying that uh, fear of change is uh, is a biological phenomena and psychological and everything else, but it, it's it's built up from like millennia, like since we ever came on this planet, um, and, and it's designed to help us. But you know, in today's modernity, we we go a little bit crazy. And then you're saying that there needs to be something, some hope, some courage, some confidence, whatever it is, that pushes you to actually make the change. And when you do make the change and you experience this new reality, you realize that. A, a myriad of number of things. So you 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 uh, realize that uh, you never really liked your friends that much anyway, or your friends you weren't really connected and belonged with your friends. You just fitted in with them. Or wow, I met new people for the first time in thirty years, and I never knew these type of people existed. Or I do have the confidence to be alone. I do like myself alone, and all these realizations build upon themselves. So you can make further and further adjustments and you just keep on evolving. Uh, is that, that's what you're saying. I, I, I think unless I missed anything. Yep. Super cool. Exactly. Okay. So at 1000 days sober, we follow, um, James Prochaska's trans theoretical behavioral model a little bit, uh, say a little bit, a lot, but we, we changed the name a little bit. So, um, when Prochaska is talking about his stages of change, he's saying that, Everybody goes through six different stages of change. Pre-contemplation, contemplation, contemplation, uh, uh, preparation, action, maintenance, and uh, enlightenment or something. I can't remember what the last one was. Uh, You've basically finished and you're done with it, right? Um, We do something different, but we call it the strive model for change. So we have stuck, thought, research, initiative, vigilance, and evolution. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the stuck phase. So there are are two people I find in the stuck phase. One is like my dad. I always pick on my poor old dad. He's someone who is clearly addicted to alcohol, but has no idea he's addicted to alcohol because his mental map of what an addict is doesn't bear reality, right? So, so, And he's stuck because he's never going to realize the truth. And he's quite happy um, drinking alcohol, right? So he's stuck. 
But then there's another stuck person who they really do kind of want to make a change, but they don't want to make a change. So they're saying they do, but the yeah. brain, as we went back to what we talked about earlier on, really doesn't want them to change. And they're really yeah. stuck and they can't get movement. They cannot get through it. And one of the things that I've spotted in all people who go through this phase is a lack of personal integrity. It just is not there or it is, it's been battered through decades of societal conditioning or trauma or whatever. Um, and I'd really like to talk to you about your views on personal integrity because I know you do a lot of work around this. So just crack on. I'm going to sit back and have a cup of tea and listen to you talk about personal integrity. <laughs> Okay. Well, first of all, I just want to say that personal integrity, which we've actually trademarked. Okay. So we have a very specific definition. When you, of say, it. When you say we, sorry, Alyssa, could you just we, explain yeah. to people what that means? Totally. Good question. I work for an international life coaching and executive consulting company. And that was founded by two sisters over 20 years ago. The founder develop the methodology that we use and is now being taught in schools like MIT and Stanford and about 50 other universities around the world. And it's all based in this fundamental concept of creating change that is rooted in what we call personal integrity. Personal integrity is not something anyone ever has, okay? Still to this day, after 10 years of working this program. I don't have it. It's a verb. It's something I practice. It's something mm -hmm. I consciously choose moment by moment. So the definition of how we use personal integrity is, the, is making and keeping a promise to yourself that it aligns with your highest ideals. Okay. So what that means is Let's say, first you have to really go, okay, what, what do I truly care about? What do I really care about, right? So your dad might not care about not drinking. But there is something he does care about, right? For me, I really cared about having a healthy body, okay? Um, I also really cared about my job. I've always been somebody that has loved working. And when I found coaching, I was like, this is absolutely my dream. Helping people in this way is absolutely what I, what I love to do. So the first thing is to really go, what do I care about? Then personal integrity is about using our mind to come up with the right plan. Okay, I care about a healthy body. I'm going to exercise five times a week. I'm going to eat three meals a day. It's simple. It's not complicated. It's literally what you need to do to have the dream. And when you're, when I say make a promise, what I'm saying is literally the plan is to say specifically what you're going to do that aligns with the dream. I'm not going to drink for a month right? Like it's simple. And then your body follows through with the action. Okay. So that, that alignment of your body taking actions, your mind with the thinking and planning and your heart with your highest ideals, that alignment of heart, mind, and body is what we call personal integrity. Okay. Now, sounds simple straightforward. Yeah. Have you ever made a promise to yourself and broken it? Last night. Yes. What was it? Um, I keep, well, hmm, is this the right one or not? Let me think. Let me think a minute. <laughs> mm. right. Which promise do I want to well, share? No, this is, okay. So I'm always talking on here about my anger. So, yeah. So I have a, I wrote in my journal this morning, I feel like I am a walking subconscious robot mm. that just talks to people who are close to me in scripts 
and I don't like the way that I do it. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't feel, no, the problem is it does feel right, but it, it hurts people. So yesterday, for example, my daughter, as I was taking her up the stairs, she's like three and I was taking her up the stairs to take her to bed and she kicked me in the face and I lost my temper and said, do not kick me in the face. And then she kicked me again in the face. Now, Rationally and logically, I realize that she's a three-year-old and she doesn't, and that is a method that she's using to interact and communicate with me that she's unhappy. Mm. Um, but this, this, this automatic behavior that is definitely linked to the way I was parented um, mm. is I need to be in control of this little person right now and put her straight. So I, sh- I mm. shout. And then she later told her mom that she was afraid of me. Now, do I, do I want that? No, that's not aligned with what I would say is personal integrity. But then there's also a little part of me that is making excuses by saying, well, it's normal behavior, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, this morning I talked to her about it and I apologized and she forgave me. And, but that is, that is a, an example. Unwi- un- unwrap that one for me, Alicia. Good. Excellent. That's a, that's a brilliant example. Let me just ask you this question. What was the promise that you made to yourself in your head? that you broke, according to you? It was um, that I would realize that, I would realize that a neocortex isn't formed. And when she, when she does something that really bugs me, that I've, I've got to take a pause and I've got to get to her level and I've got to treat it right. with respect. Right. Okay, great. So the promise is I'm going to take a pause before I react. And then you didn't do that. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So we, ha- you have to understand that human beings are lousy at keeping promises to themselves in the areas that there is bad wiring. And, and I'm going to say it for the sake of, you know, this moment, there is something that is in your wiring from like, I, she needs to understand what I'm saying, I need to control. Like I heard that the control piece of it. Yeah, definitely. Right. And then you're like, where did that come from? That doesn't align with my ideal for who I want to be as her father. Right. Not, not today. Not today. I mean, since I've changed and gone on, you know, like when when we stop drinking, I don't know if you do this, but I look at it very binary like addicts do. And I'm like, I had my life before I drank and I got my life after I stopped. Right. And, and my values and my ideals of what a, um, I should be behaving like are very different to what they should do, but I get confused because the two are very prominent in my mind. Yes. So this is what we're all facing when we make a promise to ourselves. The minute that we make a promise to ourselves, there is all of the thoughts that happen, right? Well, she should respect me. She doesn't respect me. What's her problem? Like all of the, we call, we call that, we have a quick way of saying that in the handout group, just a quick shorthand called the brat and the chicken, two main voices that are talking to us. And this is a funny way to start to get a sense of humor about our humanity because everybody has these voices. Mm-hmm. So the brat is the entitled sort of like they should, I deserve it, almost prideful. A lot of times with drinking, right? It's like, I deserve the wine. I deserve a drink. I deserve the need to relax. That like, I deserve it. Leave me alone. This is what I want. Brat entitled, okay? Then there's chicken. Chicken is fear, right? Exactly what we were speaking to earlier. So the minute that we make a promise, you have these voices speaking to you in whatever version that they sound. And that sounds like, to to me, was it sound more like a brat or a chicken to you? The way that I was behaving? Yeah. um, On the kind of like the first layer, if I'm an onion, I guess, it's definitely the brat. Yes. But I think think underneath the layers, there's there's a chicken. Yes, exactly. What's the fear? Just so you can articulate it? Um, I think the fear is uh, t- uh, twofold, probably more, but uh, the first two things that come to mind are um, if, if, I, if, I allow her, if I get to her level 
which is bizarre. I feel so ridiculous saying this, but if I get to her level and communicate the way I should be and effectively, I'm less of a man. That's one fear. And uh, the second fear I have is if people see me behaving like this. So let's say she kicks out in a supermarket and she's saying things like, no, I want that doll right now, right? Or I think you're stupid or whatever. And I get down to a level and say, wow, you're really angry right now. And people watch me behaving like that. Again, I've got this ego. It's all about me, self-centeredness, fear that people are going to think that I'm a ridiculous father. I think that's there too. Okay, good. So you can hear how there's initially, there's sort of the bratty voice of she should do what I say. Then mm-hmm. there's the underlying fear of people will think that I'm a bad father. What will other people think of me? Yeah. Right? Okay. So both of those voices justify doing the opposite of your promise. And this is why... Personal, this is why on just a, a subconscious level, if we make promises to ourselves that we don't keep, we don't trust ourselves. Okay. It's just like if you tell anybody, right? Most most of us have an easier time keeping a promise to somebody else. If you tell your daughter you're gonna pick her up from school at three o'clock. Right? Do you do it most of the time? Oh, sorry, sorry. Are you asking me? Yes, yes. Most of the time, yeah. Right. And the reason why you keep the promise to her is why? Why do? Why is it easier to keep a promise to somebody else? Uh, In that, in that case, I I guess it's a, it's a. She she relies on me like it's her age, and I cannot. Like I probably would be slightly different if if she was (laughs) nineteen. Exactly. But she relies on you. And so you want her to respect you and you want her to trust you. Right. Uh, actually, actually. Tell me. <laughs> okay. So this, this might tap into my, the, the fear and as well is I also don't want the teachers thinking I'm a bad father by not turning up on time. So there's, yeah. there's a, there's a perverse kind of e- egoic thing there as well. The other thing I was going to just uh, ask you when you said uh, if we make promises we can't keep, we don't trust ourselves, um, yeah. that spoke okay. to me, but, but even deeper, I don't know who I am. Yes, exactly. So what you want to understand is that personal integrity comes from trusting ourselves and our word. When we make promises we don't keep, we can't trust ourselves. It's as simple as that. And then the most important relationship that we have is the one with ourselves and our word. So when we don't trust ourselves on the small things, like that's something sort of, you know, minor, right? Like you said to yourself, I'm not going to explode. And then you do. And the reason why you do is because you have the brat and the chicken, these underlying thought processes that have you respond the way that you do. So personal integrity, what it's all about is first coming up with a specific plan of what you're going to do and announcing it. Okay. So I'm not going to explode. That's specific, straightforward. Okay. Now the way to train ourselves in doing that action are three different key ingredients. Can I, can, can I, before we get to the free ingredients, I think there's a really important point to cover here. Please, let's Uh, do it. Okay. (laughs) This is, this is something that we cover deeply in 1000 Days Sober Experience. And I didn't realize this, this actually, I'm actually behaving the opposite way in my relationship with my daughter. Okay. So what we, what we, what we say at some state, it's in the, it is it we touch upon it in the stuck phase a little bit, but we we touch upon it. And that's becoming the voice of resistance. So we say to people, so you want to check you want to stop drinking alcohol, do you? It's like, yeah. Okay. So make a list of all the things that you love about alcohol, all the value and joy that it brings in your life. And also make a list of all the reasons you would be so much better off not working with me for one thousand days. 
And that list is always massive. It is so big, Lisa, right? And then we turn around and say to them, okay, wow, you love alcohol that much and it's going to be that bad and miserable and hard and challenging to work with me. Why bother? Like, let's just stop this right now. It's clear you don't want to do it, right? And then they're like, no, 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 hang on a minute. And then they find a real reason, a, tr- a real non-negotiable, like could be, but I'm going to die or my marriage will end or I'll lose my job. And now that, so now the, the, the pain of drinking suddenly becomes more acute than the pain of not drinking. And that, that list of pleasures of drinking starts to shrink compared to the pleasures of, or, or the intensity of the pleasure, right? Um, so very often I say to people, yeah, you, 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 you think you've, you want to change, but you, ha- you really haven't made the vow because you haven't taken stock of the importance here and made a plan, right? I, I haven't taken, and that's because they really want to drink now, and they're not ready to give it up. I'm actually doing the same with my daughter here, aren't I? So I'm actually saying to my wife, when my wife doesn't trust me because I'm showing her that I don't trust myself, I'm saying to her, oh, yeah, okay, love, okay, I, I don't want to shout at her anymore. I won't shout at her. But truthfully, I do want to shout at her. And what I need to do is I need to sit down and really consider the two options here. And, and really ask myself, do you really want to shout at your kids? And what is that going to mean for you, your personal integrity and the future of your kids? And obviously I don't, I don't want to, I'm getting some value out of it, but I don't want to. So I need to go back to square one and really look at my vow, my decision and my promise, and then put, make, make sure I'm cast iron on that. Am I really promising that I'm not going to shout at my kids? If I am, it's time to get fucking serious and stop messing about Lee. Now, then we can move on to your three really important points. Awesome. Because I I just want to point out what you just described, that process, Lee, is you coming up with your highest ideal, right? Your ideal for what you, what, what is integrity for you? So integrity is different for everybody. Everybody has different ideals that they aspire to live towards. And when, for us, we have people look, write a dream, right? So in this case, it would be your dream for your relationship with your daughter, right? So that would be what you get clear about, the why of what that is. Then you can make the specific promise. I promise, and and really be behind that because you're connected to the why you're making the promise. And the promise is something measurable and specific. I promise that I'm not going to shout at you, okay? And that is something that you announce and declare. Why? Because the minute you say it out loud is the minute you're now accountable for it. Mm. Okay. Now, most of the time, if we're not ready to make a promise to someone else, like I wasn't for a very long time with drinking, I made it in my head. Right. And then I would say, I'm not going to drink tonight, or I'm only going to have two drinks tonight, or I'm only going to have, you know, beer tonight. And then I would go out and nobody would know. So what would happen? Because I didn't have a relationship with alcohol where I trusted myself because I had an experience of breaking promises. Therefore, I would do the same thing. And nobody knew, except emotionally and psychologically, there was an impact. Mm. The impact was I didn't trust myself. And then I would go through this cycle of guilt and shame, rinse and repeat. And it impeded and impacted every area of my life. But I didn't know that. Right. And then when people are like, where does that negative inner dialogue come from? That's where. Because in the areas that we break promises to ourselves, we cannot trust ourselves. We will not have confidence. We will not have pride. And we will not have joy. So the minute you want to make a change, you have to get clear about what your highest ideals are, why it matters. Then you make a promise that's measurable and specific. I will not shout. 
and you declare it to other people. That's ingredient number one. Can I uh, make a comment on that? Sure. I think uh, the more you're talking, the more it is evident to me what your highest ideals are is a really important piece of work because um, when I said to you earlier on, I don't trust myself. So when I'm on the staircase and she's kicking me in the face, I don't trust myself. And that's going to have to come over time. I mean, I can start trusting myself right now by saying, Lee, I'm going to trust you now that you're going to do it. That's not what it's about. It's just, it's just the habit, right? So I think the work for me is what is my highest idea? I'm getting confused about the man I want to be. And, and so, so I said to Liza last night, for example, my wife, I'm okay with shouting at him to a certain degree because of la la la. And then I justified my behavior. That means my, for me, my integrity is dropped below a standard that I'm, that I want to set for myself, but I haven't set it yet. So, so I need to do some work around what my ideal self is. And I guess people who are in the stuck phase of the 1000 day sober experience have to kind of do the same. Um, you know, is, is to really touch upon that before they move on. Uh, confidence was also a key word that popped up when you were speaking there. Do I have the confidence that I'm not going to shout at my daughter? No. So. Exactly. So, but I, I just want to show you something. Lee. Any area that you haven't been successful at keeping a promise in, it makes sense that you wouldn't have confidence yet. You wouldn't trust yourself yet because you don't have the experience of doing what you say you're going to do. Okay. And that's why personal integrity is actually like building a muscle. It's a training. So I want to lay out the two other ingredients for you because I want you to see how this is almost like going to the gym for our relationship to ourselves. Okay. So you make the promise that's measurable and specific. I also like promises that are in time. So if you're somebody that wants to try, you know, quitting alcohol or drinking, um, you know, let's say 30 days, I don't want to drink for 30 days, right? Or I'm going to not choke for 30 days, or I'm going to meditate for 30 days. Giving yourself a promise that you're going to keep for a finite period of time, give some ease to your brat and your chicken, your brat being like, it's too hard. Your chicken, like, I'm scared. What if I don't do it? Mm. Because those are the voices that come up when we make a promise. Why we don't? Like, what if I can't? Okay. After you make the promise, you declare it. So this would be something you would say to your wife. Like, look, I'm committed to make this change. I know I've said it in the past. It's different now. Here's why. The next two ingredients. Second ingredient is a consequence. Okay, let me explain consequences. Um, every action that we take causes a result. Action, result. That's Newton's third law. We didn't invent it. That's what happens. That's a natural order of things. So when you say to yourself, I'm not going to yell, and then you do, that has a consequence. What is the consequence? Uh, I, I create disconnection between me and my wife and me and my daughter and fear in, in both of them. Yes. Okay. The problem with con natural consequences is that they happen over time right? Over time, there's more and more disconnection until there's a result like later on, right? But we don't feel the immediate impact. Just like if you smoked a cigarette and you said, I'm not going to smoke a cigarette, and you smoked a cigarette, and then you saw the inside of your lung in that moment, you might not smoke the cigarette. Mm. But we as human beings need immediate consequences and the natural consequences that occur in the world are not immediate. So instead of waiting for the natural consequences, we put in place a designed consequence to act as an incentive to keep the promise. As an example, it would look like this. If I shout at you, 
I'm going to sit down and read you a story for 30 minutes, or I'm going to play a game that you want to play. Consequences that we like are money. Lauren uses this. So Lauren founded the whole method. She has a trait like yours where she, we talk about traits in the handout method, which are character traits. Mm. These are hardwired into our being. Okay. She has one where she gets hot. If she gets hot, she owes anybody in the room 20 bucks. Her kids know this. Her husband knows this. She's had to pay 20 bucks about twice a year now. She used to have to pay it a lot more. Hmm. Well, what that does is it holds her accountable to training herself. Not like she's never going to get hot again, but it recalibrates the scale. It means, look, mommy's working on this. Here's how you know if I show to you, you're going to get 20 bucks. Okay. So the system of promise and consequence lets you train yourself in keeping your word. And then the last ingredient is that you tell somebody. So you don't just tell the promise, you tell the consequence. And this is why a coach is effective or a buddy or why we have our online program in our you. It's so that there is a system of accountability because when you're really looking to make a change, there has to be accountability in the change. That's why AA works because you have a sponsor mm. as an example. And when you get stuck, which we do, that's why I realize. So like the expectation that we're never going to, you're never going to yell again is not realistic. Yeah. Because you're human. And then what happens when we don't have a consequence in place is that we just break the promise. We feel bad. We feel guilty. It's this whole sub, like emotional sabotaging cycle to break out of that you put in place the consequence, you tell somebody and then you you learn, right? So um, this is something that I do a lot of work with in this moment in time with COVID, for example, where people have all different schedules. Like all of a sudden we went from going to work every day to being home every day. And now all of a sudden people are like, back to being a kid, like eating pizza and not working until 11 o'clock and watching Netflix. Like Mm -hmm. what happened? (laughs) Okay. And putting in place a promise, like I do four hours of work in the morning or I lose my Netflix at night. Very simple. All of a sudden uses your cheat, your reward, your vice only after you do the work, it uses it as an incentive. We already do this with kids, right? You have to eat your meal before you get dessert. Like this whole balance is already happening in many ways, but in the, we're just using it. What we already know works in a way to train ourselves to keep our word in an area we haven't been able to do so before. Make sense? Question. The, I was going to, I was going to ask you where you see the biggest challenges that people face using these three um it's almost like a a recipe or a roadmap right um i look i look at myself and i think to myself the con my problem as in all my addictions and because this is actually listening to you this is just this is life like i just wrote a note introduces throughout my life not introduces with my daughter or introduces with my, uh, what am I addicted to now? Uh, work. Right. So it, I'm not thinking about my addiction. I'm thinking now this should be the way you live your life, which is, which is what we're trying to get to on 1000 day sober is, is say, let's not focus on the alcohol. Let's focus on how, how we live our life. What is our, our ideal. And then how are we going to schedule how are we going to break that down into action, schedule them, and then do them? This is where the consequence comes in and telling people. <laughs> I think the biggest challenge is actually that initial promise. So if, if we think about people who are in the stuck phase, it's that I'm not going to drink for X amount of days. That, that is the biggest promise, which, again, I think will, a lot of it will be related to trust 
and status. So I don't want to tell you that I'm not drinking. This is one I hear a lot with uh, people. I don't want to tell my friends I'm not drinking because then if I do drink, I'll look like a dick. So is there, is there, is there pre-work? What is, what is the work that comes before the promise, do you think? The pre-work, when, when someone comes to coaching, we have them write up their dreams and write a dream in each of the different areas of their life. And we say there are 12. So your relationship with yourself, your relationship with your body, with your family, with your friends. So first getting clear, like you talked about, about the what, which is really you getting clear about the why, why you care. Your right. stand, it's like your standards, isn't it? It's like exactly. Hmm. It's like I care because I want a relationship with my daughter where I respond peacefully with her and I treat her with love and with care. And the language that we use when we write a dream is important because oftentimes we'll write or think about what we don't want. Like, I don't want to drink anymore. And then that's kind of like we're trying to control the vice. Mm. It doesn't open us up to the why we don't want to drink. Why we don't want to drink is not so we don't drink. It's so we can feel better in our body. Right? So when I stopped drinking, it was like, so I'll just tell you my story mm. about drinking. Because I made a lot of, I, I had a dream to really feel balanced in my body. It was not the aesthetic for me. It was like this relationship with alcohol. Where I was never free of it because I would make promises and break them. And so I had a dream that I would just feel free of any, like free in my body free to choose when I drank and stop drinking, but it was, it was more like free in my body and healthy. And then I made a promise that aligned with that. I would have four drinks, for example, that was a simple one. And, you know, making that promise was put me accountable to wanting to actually change my relationship to alcohol. I went from having no promises whatsoever. I could drink as much as I wanted to like, okay, let me just deal with this. Let me just say, I'm going to have four drinks on the weekend, two drinks a night. Mm. Okay. And then I had a consequence. If I have more than four drinks, then I'm going to lose my alcohol the next week. I'm not going to drink at all. Mm. And when I told people, and, and then I had to get over my fear of telling people about that. And what I said to people was like, I, I spoke from the dream. I'm going to have four drinks tonight because it's my dream to feel good on Monday morning, feel good in my body. So when you're clear about your why, it also gives you the communication to other people about why you're making a change. So then people can support you in that. Because oftentimes, if we don't communicate the why in the context, people don't understand and then people have their own relationships to alcohol. So people, you know, it, we are not grounded in our own integrity of why we're doing something. And then we are more susceptible to other people making comments or isolating, you know, whatever other people do. So that was the promise that I put in place. That was the consequence. Okay, now I'm going and I'm doing my thing, except, uh-oh, I have a problem. I can't keep the promise. Mm. So then I gave up alcohol altogether. Now, for me, because I am an alcoholic, what happened was even when I put the alcohol down, my life was still unmanageable. Mm. And I, I got fired from my job. Like, look, you're not performing. What are you hiding? What are you not saying? And when I made a list of everything that I was lying and hiding and not saying, alcohol was the one that I was like thinking about it more than I wanted to admit, more than I wanted to tell people. And then that's when I had to go, when, when I had to deal with the fact that I needed something more than a promise and a consequence because I, I was powerless. It could not keep the promise to myself. And so this is a good way to actually see, I think, if like, what, like, can you stop your drinking? Can you make a promise? You know, if I could keep that four drink max and that was no problem, right? 
great. It was a, you know, or if I could keep 30 days, like the experience to give yourself a time off of alcohol and see what your experience is, right? For me, I couldn't take time off. It really didn't work. That's why I had to go and do something. I needed something more. I needed AA. Mm -hmm. So I think the last thing I'll just say is when you, um, it is important to get clear about the the highest values and the why, because then what, what happens is you lock in place a structure of accountability. And then when you lock in place the structure of accountability, right? Let's say you, for you, I'm not going to, I'm not going to explode on my daughter. If I do, then I get the hour with her of fun time, right? And then there is all of what happens up here. I should be able to, what if other people? So like all of that happens, but because we have accountability, and because there's a consequence, like for me, it was like, I really had a think, tw- for, I'll give you another example. I'm, when I trained myself to meditate, I gave myself 30 days of meditation in the morning, right? I, if I didn't meditate, I didn't have my coffee that day. That got me to meditate. Because the minute that I wanted my coffee, I'm like, well, you have to meditate first. So that incentive then had me kill my inner dialogue that wanted to do what I wanted to do and take it out. <laughs> I just thought of a consequence for myself, actually. I was just thinking, of, I was just thinking about how difficult consequences are. Um, and I was thinking to myself, um, <laughs> so I'm supposed to go to bed at 10 o'clock and wake up at 6 o'clock, but I invariably go to bed like half 11, 12 and wake up at 6 so a good consequence for me would be, now Lee, you have to go to bed at 10 o'clock. You have to. You're not allowed to read a book. You're not allowed to do anything. You literally have to lie in bed at 10 o'clock and go to sleep. And, and that, that would drive me bonkers. So that's a good one, yeah. I'll, I'll, think, of, I'll think of some more. Okay, good. So that's, that's a great example. So, like, do you want to use that for your... I- your daughter. I, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a think about it because I think when you think about consequences as well, I got to think about how I'm because this 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 is much bigger than what we're talking about actually for me because I don't want to say to myself I don't want to be the kind of guy who shouts at my daughter or loses my shit with my daughter. I don't want to be the guy who loses his shit. I don't want to be the guy who shouts at people. I don't want to be the guy who uses it. So it's bigger than that. So really, you know, I want to do this A3 work about my higher self, like really look at that and see what comes out of it. But I also want to share that with my daughter as well. So she understands what dad is doing because I eventually, I want her to live that kind of life and to grow up being, you know, going through these kind of like the things that they don't teach you in school. Yes. Um, to, to get her own understanding of dreams, visions, meaning, purpose, that type of thing. So I've got to be really careful around the consequences because I imagine one of them that come up to my head was, Zia, every time I shout at you, I promise I'm going to put 10 bucks in your piggy bank, which is over there, and then you can buy some new shoes. Now, I imagine my daughter would be like, shout at me. Come on, bring it on, shout <laughs> at me. She'll be kicking me in the face. I mean, that might actually help me to like build more control. I, I don't know, but I, you get a point. I've got to be a bit careful around how this fits into her upbringing as well, you know? So I think the, the, the great part about what you just said is that the consequence and having a dialogue about it makes it a conversation. It makes her be able to call you out and vice versa because mm. what happens with our traits, which are like – deeply rooted our character traits. Yeah. That if you're not aware of them, if you're not talking about them, if you're not in a plan to manage them, they become the elephant in the room. The thing yeah. people can't call out. So if you're like, honey, I'm not going to shout at you. You'll get $10 in the piggy bank. She's like, okay, great dad. I get to call you out. It's right. So you I, could, I think that's, a, I actually think that's a smart. She, concept. And let me give you an example about this little girl, right? So she will call me out. So this morning I'm doing um, 
sit-ups. I'm doing sit-ups and she's supposed to eat a breakfast with her mom and she comes over and jumps on my stomach while I'm doing sit-ups. So I say, no, go, you go and have your breakfast here. And then she puts her foot in my face. I said, what have I told you about putting your foot in my face? So she goes to put it in my face again. And she's smiling, right? So I said to it, Zia, I love you very much. But if you put your foot in my face one more time, I'm going to have to leave you. I'm going to have to go upstairs and go away from you because it is unacceptable for me that you hit me, right? And then she did it again. So I said, okay, I'm going away from you now, okay? And as I started to walk upstairs, she shouted up the stairs, and while you're up there, take care of your feelings. <laughs> And she's three. <laughs> and I came back downstairs and my wife was just mouthing to me going, take care of your feelings, you know? And I was like, yeah, okay, this kid's learning. <laughs> she could be, she is my greatest teacher. Kids are our greatest teacher. Amen. Amen. So mm. the, the, the cute part about that is like, she meets your anger with her own anger. Like it's, it's yeah. a, a reaction. So, so because of that, you really could also pick a consequence that is doing an act of generosity, like a recalibrating, like having to be, do something loving for her. Yeah. Yeah. She really likes me telling stories, like nonstop. Exactly. Imaginary stories, imaginary stories, imaginary stories. So that might be, that might be having her get to decide. The story. One, one hour, one hour to dad just one nonstop play. Hour. I love that. That is it. I'm going to do that one. I love that. Mm. So you put that in Lee for 30 days. You tell your wife, you tell your daughter, and now you have a real plan. Now yeah. you have a real structure of accountability and that's what this is all about. I love it. Alyssa, it's been absolutely incredible talking to you. Where can people learn more about the Handle Method and the NEU program? So you can come to our website, handelgroup.com, and then NRU is a our online program which has all of this in one platform. You get a private coaching session. You get a promise tracker to actually put the promises and consequences like you just discussed you get a buddy so it's giving you everything to be accountable for a change you want to make mm -hmm. and you can find that through inner you dot coach we're giving it for 50 percent off to people right now because we know that this is a moment in time where this work is so powerful and useful and needed, you can use my coupon, Alyssa, A-L-Y-S-S-A, 325 for half off. And you can also find me at Alyssa at HenzelGroup.com. Uh, brilliant. It's been wonderful having you on. Keep making a difference in the world, Alyssa. And we'll have you on again in the future because I know we've got a lot more we can talk about. We just touched on personal integrity today, but there's so many more tools in your box. So thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you have a good day. Thank you for listening to the Alcohol Addiction Podcast. Now, before you run away, just a few things, okay? So, the next time we run the 1,000 Day Sober Experience, our program that guides you and helps you to become 1,000 Day Sober, so that's 2.7 years, folks, right? It's the only long-term program in the world where we're with you constantly to help and guide you through the six stages of the Strive Model for Change. We get you through being stuck. We get you through thinking and the ambivalence around drinking alcohol. We get you through the research phase of making some change. We get you through the change. We manage you through that change. And then after that, with alcohol in the rearview mirror, we help you to evolve, to live a fulfilled life, to do that incredibly important post-recovery work which so many people, so many organizations out there dismiss or just don't even cover at all, right? So we got you back for 1,000 days. The next time we run an experience will be in July. But do not wait until then. The best thing that you can do right now is to get over to www.1000daysober.com and sign up to be a member of Strive today. Okay, it is forty pounds a month subscription that includes uh, the one thousand day sober experience. It includes uh, online workshop. It includes online meetings. It includes guidance from our ambassadors. It includes one on one meetings with our incredible Strive coaches who are 
uh, skilled at a vast array of important elements of your life that are going to drive up and increase your physical and mental health. And by joining now, you get used to the environment, you get used to the community, you get used to the people. And you, when by the time July comes along, you'll be firing on all cylinders, kind of roaring to get into the 1000 Days Sober Experience. So do that today. Really, really important. If you want to get the show notes for today, the show notes are exceptional, folks. You get the show notes from today's episode. You want to get a full transcription of today's episode. And you want to get a special workbook um, that will give you some, some fun and interesting questions based on today's episode that you can help that will um, one-up your life, right? Then get over to www. 1000daysober.com. You will find the link there and sign up, give us your email address, and we will give you, uh, we will give you these things free of charge. Okay. And on that 40 pounds a month, if you do not have the money, if you are struggling financially, then email me at the truth by alcohol at gmail.com and we'll figure something out. Do not let money get in your way of becoming 1000 days sober. And just because we go 1000 days sober, right? Don't be worried about that if you're not quite ready to quit yet. The first stage of the Strive Model for Change is called stuck. The second stage is called thought. And we do not expect you to stop drinking whilst you're doing that work. And that will take you a good four to five months. So you get a lot of grace. We will meet you where you're at in your addiction to alcohol. Don't worry about that, okay? We take on everybody. People who are desperately trying to stop drinking and people who stop drinking and they just want help putting their life back together, okay? Um, lastly, if you enjoyed listening to our content podcast, then please rate and review it on your local provider, whether that would be Apple or SoundCloud or whatever. Uh, just give us a nice review and some nice stars. You can find us on Instagram at 1000daysober.com or 1000daysober. And you can find us on YouTube, 1000daysober as well. All right, take care yourselves, folks. Ciao, ciao.